Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Over the past two years, a lot of parents were forced into a homeschooling situation, as many schools went virtual to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. It was a tough time and made us so much more appreciative of our schools and teachers. The public school system in Fayette County has been through turbulent times in the past, and in fact, public education here in Lexington can attribute its inception to another pandemic, the cholera epidemic of the early 1830s. Now, we've covered that subject in a series of episodes a few years ago when we first launched this podcast, but I'll just give you a brief overview here. The cholera epidemic came in waves over the middle part of the 19th century. In the summer of 1833, when Lexington's population was approximately 7,000, cholera would claim the lives of over 500 people. It left behind a lot of orphans and families without any source of income. Keep in mind that this was right around the time that the Kentucky legislature chartered the city of Lexington. The first mayor of Lexington, John W. Hunt, was elected in 1832, and the following year he organized a committee to come up with a plan to help educate the children from lower-income families and the orphans that were left behind during the cholera epidemic. According to the research I found on the website of Lexington History Museum, the very first school would open at an old church on the corner of Short Street and Walnut what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard, with around 107 students in attendance. In 1836, William Lord Morton, an extremely wealthy local merchant, passed away, and he bequeathed one-ninth of his estate to the local school district. An 1897 Lexington Leader article described the event. William Morton was a friend of poor boys and girls who desired to be educated. And when he died in 1836, it was found that he had made all of the children in Lexington his heirs, giving for their benefit one ninth of his estate, which he had devised in trust to be safely invested and the income to be used in maintaining a free public school. And the first school was called Morton in his memory. As such, the city was able to open a total of three schools. The charter of the city of Lexington indicates that school number one would be called the Morton School and would educate students in ward number two. The Harrison School, school number two, would be for ward number one. And finally, the third school would be named the Dudley School for ward number four, named after the famous Dr. Benjamin Dudley, of course. And a side note, school number three, the Dudley School building, currently is the home of a very popular coffee house, rightfully called Old School House Coffee. Very good coffee. The following is an excerpt from William Henry Perrin's book, The History of Fayette County, Kentucky. The teachers of the schools are as follows. City School Number 1, Principal G.D. Hunt. First Assistant, Miss Lizzie Gill. The Second Assistant, Miss Jane Wirt. Third Assistant, Miss Carrie Wade. Fourth Assistant, Miss Jane Holt. City School Number 2, the principal is J.B. Skinner. First Assistant, Miss Sarah Roten. Second Assistant, Miss Lydie Turner. Third Assistant, Miss Nanny Pulliam. Fourth Assistant, Miss Sally Frost. City School Number 3, principal is J.R. Graves. And then the first assistant, Miss Molly Dacia. And then the second assistant would be Miss Jenny Randall. And third assistant, Miss Letitia Bullock. Fourth assistant, Miss Nanny Jones. By the 1850s, the Kentucky legislature would require every county and city to maintain a common school system and use funds appropriated by Frankfurt, as well as be able to impose a local tax to cover the costs. And as you can imagine, the opinion sections of the newspapers were hopping with opposing viewpoints about school funding. But I guess some things never change. In 1852, Transylvania High School was established to educate the older children after they were done with their primary schooling. Perrin, in his book, describes that the requirement to attend this high school was that you had to be 16 years of age. And although not explicitly stated, the student body was mostly white male. The education of girls over 16 would be left to various private schools, such as the Seraphimil Institute, 
established by David A. Sayre and another boarding school that was opened through the Episcopal Church. The need to establish more schools grew throughout the city to address overcrowding. And so by 1856, the Davidson School, school number five, would open its doors. As civil war broke out in the country, teachers continued to teach. Until 1864, public funds were not allocated to educate black children. After the end of the Civil War, the Kentucky legislature established segregated schools that would be funded by black taxpayers, collected and deposited by an appointed treasurer in a, quote, Negro school fund, close quote. The acts of the Kentucky legislature to incorporate the city of Lexington were updated in 1873 to indicate that no white children would attend a public school intended for black children and no black children would attend schools that were intended for white children. And that's in chapter 30, section 411. Side note number two. I found it very interesting that they added several sections requiring the vaccination of students against smallpox. Principals were actually required to examine students for the vaccination mark before admitting them into the school. This version of the city's incorporation can be found in the Kentucky Rooms Digital Archives and accessible through the Lexington Public Library's website. Okay. Back to segregated schools. So in 1866, Reverend Frederick Braxton established the very first school for African-American students in Lexington at the Methodist Church on Main and Church Streets. The Lexington History Museum indicates that 300 students attended the first year and, and the purchase of the building was funded through the efforts of a group of black women. Subsequently, the Freedmen's Bureau would help fund the schools. And the Freedmen's Bureau was a federal agency actually commissioned by an act of Congress in 1865 to manage all matters relating to freedmen, refugees, and other disputed lands uh, post-Civil War. Attendance at the school would grow to 900 around 1868 and would expand its location to the First Baptist Church, Pleasant Green Baptist Church, Main Street Baptist Church and Christian Church, and you'll find that many church buildings were used to educate students. The need for space and teacher would grow, uh, but the funding never met the needs. There was never enough revenue from the taxes collected for black taxpayers, as you can imagine, in comparison to white schools. In 1873, the Lexington City Council would appoint an advisory board to address the funding needs of the segregated schools, particularly how to pay for the salaries for the teachers. The city agreed to provide that funding, but the advisory board would pay for materials, fees, and the utilities to operate the buildings. Those buildings included three schools at the time, Corral Street School, Fourth Street School, and Church Street School. For the rest of the 19th century, various segregated schools would open and close their doors based on attendance and funding. Most notably, in 1888, Fourth Street School would be constructed to accommodate the largest student body with eight classrooms. The principal, Green P. Russell, was appointed in 1890 to head that school, but would later convert the school to the very first high school for black students. And that principal, uh, Principal Russell, would become the supervisor of all three segregated schools. And by 1895, Fourth Street High School would be named after him. There wouldn't be another high school for black students until 1923, when Dunbar High School opened its doors, named after the acclaimed black novelist and poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar. This high school would be the first black high school in Kentucky to be accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools. It is worth noting that a couple of issues of the Dunbar Echo uh, have been scanned by our staff and are available in the Kentucky Room Digital Archives if you want to look up those. During the restructure of the city's own corporation that I mentioned earlier in 1873, the state legislature established the Lexington Board of Education as a special taxing district in order for them to appropriate funds for schools operations. This board would have elected members from each of the city's four wards, as well as the superintendent who was elected for a four year term. The very first elected superintendent was James O. Harrison. Following him was John O. Hodges. 1880, in 1880 and in 1888, M.A. Cassidy would replace Hodges. Massillian Alexander Cassidy was known to be a progressive educator that would remain the superintendent of the Lexington school system until around 1928 upon his passing. However, in 1893, in the middle of his term, Cassidy would leave the city school system and head over to the Fayette County school system until 1902. 
So yes, there are two separate entities at that time. You know, there was a Fayette County school system and then a Lexington City school system before they merged. During his time as a superintendent, Cassidy coordinated several openings of new schools to accommodate the increasing attendance, including the conversion of Morton uh, into a high school and the opening of Lexington High School, Jefferson Davis Elementary School, and the new construction of a high school on Main Street in Walton, what would be known as Henry Clay High School. Overall, Cassidy would oversee the expansion of the school system from three schools to 12, all of modern construction. In the mid-1930s, when the city allocated attractive land on Tate's Creek Pike to be the site for two new schools, one would be named Morton Junior High School and the other one would be Cassidy Elementary School. Now let's talk about the Fayette County Board of Education, which was chartered in 1873, and its first superintendent was B.N. Graham. And the first school was opened on Sandersville, which was just a single-room schoolhouse. The number two school was on Richmond Road, and number three school was on Childsburg, and number four was on East Hickman. When Cassidy was hired by the county board to head the expansion of the school system, he immediately required teachers to be certified and buildings to be repaired. In 1905, the board appointed its first female superintendent, Nanny G. Faulkner, who would later consolidate all of the small county schools, around 31 schools, into regional schools. And that would be divided into four regions, southern, western, northern, and eastern. Faulkner would remain the superintendent until 1921, when she was forced to resign over some financial problems. Just as with the Lexington City Schools, Fayette County had several small segregated schools. These schools were established in and around the surrounding farms into Athens School, Bracktown, Jonestown, Maddoxtown, etc. And there's a full list of these schools that can be found on the website of the Lexington History Museum. Eventually, after World War II, all the county segregated schools would be consolidated into Douglas School on Price Road, named after the abolitionist and statesman Frederick Douglass. When the Supreme Court decided on Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, the schools in the city and the county began the progress of desegregation. The county schools decided to close Douglas School and the city converted Dunbar High School into a junior high school. Black students would be dispersed to schools as close to their neighborhood as possible. However, Lexington neighborhoods were segregated and schools never really fully integrated. The primary and junior high schools, for the most part, would remain segregated, even when the county and city decided to merge later in 1967. This would, of course, lead to a controversy over local desegregation efforts. Newspaper articles in the Lexington Herald and Leader in the early 1970s covered the case of Robert Jefferson et al. uh, versus the Fayette County Board of Education. Robert Jefferson, and along with four parents, sued the Fayette County school system in the U.S. District Court. They stated that the district wasn't complying with the federal law to desegregate elementary junior high schools and violated the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Robert Jefferson, a longtime Lexington civil rights activist, was one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. He would also later become a council member. U.S. District Court would side with the plaintiffs and prompt the school board to be more proactive in desegregating all of its schools. As discussed in a previous podcast on the county-city merger, the city of Lexington was growing very rapidly, and it would continue to annex plots of land in the surrounding area, making it difficult for the county to maintain its presence as a governing body. The population growth of the baby boomer generation needed to be accommodated by adding more school buildings. And in 1960, after several years of debate, a committee was formed to begin studying the possible merger between Lexington City Schools and Fayette County Schools. And of course, on July 1st, 1967, the merger was finalized and the two school systems would become one body governed by what we know today as the Fayette County Board of Education. Since then, the public school system has witnessed many changes, many trials and many celebrations, but the one constant are the grateful parents and students for the teachers, staff, and administration that has been educating Lexington's young citizens for almost two centuries. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, 
rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at L-E-X-P-U-B-L-I-B dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.